Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Thought Leaders. I'm your host, Chris Shang. And today we have Jane Franklin, who is CEO of New Start. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure, Chris, to be here. Of course. Tell us a little bit about New Start. What it is that you do and what kind of companies do you guys work with? Yeah, um, well, my New Start is quite different to a lot of organizations out there. It's a small organization, mostly comprised of, of myself and a small team. And I work mostly as an influencer. So an influencer, a thought leader, um, a brand ambassador, and an advisor um, in cybersecurity. Got it. And, and how did you, let's, let's talk about this. I know you spent a couple of decades in cyber, uh, in the cyberspace. Um, yeah. What, what was that like? How did you get involved into, um, into just kind of like the cybersecurity world in the very beginning? Um, and yeah. then, yeah, and then we'll speak to maybe towards the aspect of becoming a thought leader and what did that actually take? But tell us a little bit about that previous background, the previous chapters of your career. Yes. Yeah, so I, I've got, I would say quite an unusual route into certainly cybersecurity and being an entrepreneur. So my my kind of journey started straight as being an entrepreneur. So I didn't come from a tech background. I actually came from an art and design background. Mm. And I I built a, a cybersecurity company. It was, it was actually a tech company, but we specialized in cybersecurity. And that was over two decades ago. It was in 1997. And I thought it would be really good to lead with security. And the reason that it attracted me was because for me at that point in time, there were only two things that I thought were really interesting. One was cybersecurity and the other was AI. And in 1997, cybersecurity was really just, just taking off. Whereas AI, it was so early, it was so early for it. And you know, my business partner and I really thought that it wasn't feasible to to kind of lead with with AI. So we led with um, cybersecurity, and I built well. I built the first female owned penetration testing, um, which we kind of like fondly referred to as hacking. So company, um, all of those years ago. So that was my route into into the industry, straight off building a business as opposed to maybe a more traditional route, which is you know, coming to it from having studied IT or maybe have having done you know a, a STEM degree or something like that. So I, I just, <laughs> it's absolute madness. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're, so you're a non-technical founder that decided to go start a, a very technical product, ultimately. Yeah, ab absolutely, yeah, I mean, but I, I, I founded this consultancy and we were elite. We were high end. You know, we were very, very service driven. And um, but I had no experience at all. But one thing that I am good at doing is spotting gaps in the market and mm. also kind of like looking at trends and seeing where they're going. So I didn't know that really at the time, but I just kind of did what interested me and where I felt that there was a market. And so my business partner and I built this this company. We we started off with high availability servers, um, networking kit, and and security. And in those days, it was very very different. It was really, I would say, far more of a technical domain than it is now. It's it's so diverse now. I, I think it's far more enjoyable now than actually when it when it was in those days. And and also in those days, it was quite simple. You know, it was IT security. We referred to it as IT security or information security as opposed to cybersecurity. Yeah. I'm curious as to, you know, you mentioned you came from a design background before starting yeah. that. Um, yeah, but, I, you know, I think like I was just watching this video around Jack Ma who gave his like first, oh, you've probably seen this, like a grainy, like his original video to like a room of 10 people talking about building Alibaba. And I was just thinking about it like, if you're sitting in that room, it's got to feel a little crazy because this person has no technical background whatsoever. He was, he had a translation business, which has you know, nothing to do with e-commerce, but he's like telling it about this like vision and this dream of like what he's thinking of Alibaba to become obviously, you know, fast forward to today and we know what it is. Um, yeah. But if you think about it back then, it just seems so probably disconnected if you're sitting in that room. And I'm curious though, like a lot of the successful founders I've seen, you know, 
maybe on paper don't look like the best match to start that business. And maybe in your case is very similar, but like, what about that experience or what about you specifically would you say then made you the right person to do it? Because I, I think at the core of everything is like a great founder is just like a, somebody who is relentless and obsessive about a specific problem and, and then it's the, their ability to figure it out. Right. Like, and, and the discipline to do it. Yeah. I, th I think you touched on something really important there. Well, two, two things are, that really stand out for me. One is having that vision. So you have to have that vision and you have to be able to sell that vision. You've got to take people with you and inspire them. And you've got to attract when you're starting, you're starting a company, then, you know, it's, it's bloody hard. You know, it's hard. My company was organically grown, so we had no investment. So if we failed, you know, we were back to doing our jobs, you know, and, and neither my business partner and I wanted to do that. So you have to have this this vision and you have to be able to inspire people to come and join you on it. You know, one as clients and, and two also as employees. So it's massively, massively important. And the thing, I think my strength was actually, it's actually connected to diversity because I didn't come from this tech background because I wasn't fundamentally a techie. You know, my business partner was, you know, he was the one that was, you know, sound in that area. I had, you know, pretty good, um, I would say intuition, business instinct, and I was hungry to be successful, to make money, to scale this, this business, you know, within a certain amount of time and, you know, to walk away with an exit and, and go live, go live the dream. So I was, I was really clear on that. And I had those business skills, you know, I could sell, I knew how to um, do the business operations side of things. So we complemented one another really well, as opposed to starting, you know, with two highly technical uh, people, which is, I think most of the time when I'm seeing businesses start up, that's how they're, they're starting. They're starting with similar skills as opposed to complementary and i think that's why you know we we did well we were we were on the same page we had complementary skills and we were really clear with what we wanted to get from it and what type of business we were building we were building an elite um, service driven organization that was going to be leading in the market and, and we did that we did that really well i mean we made loads of mistakes as well as we went along but um that that enabled us to to do that got it um and how much do you feel like just that coming from your background has let's talk about the journey to thought leader right and like influencer where yeah. um you know it's a different it's probably a different it's a different set of skills it's a different set of like hats that you're wearing in that capacity now right um yeah when how did you how did you make that definitive transition or was it just kind of like a gradual evolution um before at one point in time then you make a decision like i'm going all in on this yeah i would say that's exactly how how it was i mean i i didn't set out to be an influencer you know i'm, I'm still kind of like toying with what i call myself you know is it influencer <laughs> is it thought leader is it brand ambassador it, you know the conclusion that i come to is it's it's whatever <laughs> whatever works for the audience you're speaking to um but i i didn't set out to become an, an influencer what i was doing was i was writing and i was speaking about things that i was passionate about uh -huh. and i was consistent with that i wanted to help i wanted to make an impact i wanted to improve things um, and that was that was really kind of how i became an influencer i had absolutely no idea until i think it was ibm invited me to um a, a special event and um and actually said you know the reason why is because you're an influencer in, in the market and we want to get to know you we want to partner with you um strategically and that's kind of how how it happened and that was my first kind of inclination <laughs> that i was becoming an influencer or or um had had influence and then and then from from that point on, I just continued, you know, continued to do the work that I was doing, acting as an advisor, getting hopefully helpful stuff out to the market that would help people. Um, and until I kind of reached a stage where, and I would say it's probably more recently, 
I where I actually kind of double down on the influencer kind of identity and actually said this is the work that I'm predominantly going to do and the uh, the reason that I did that was because I could see that's where the market was going the market oh. wanted me to kind of serve you know in that capacity and I'm very you know I, I'm very kind of I would say very much a servant leader servant to the people that I um, help and, and solve problems for and and I also recognize the skills that I have and so I want to do work that lights me up and, and that I'm good at where I can make an impact because then I'm, I'm fulfilled and then I will just keep going and 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 doing more so yeah. you know that, that I would say is is really quite re recent that I've actually just decided actually this is the work that I'm doing I'm quite happy going with the flow right now of, of being an influencer. Very cool. Um, I mean, I think that that's kind of what your journey is. I, I feel somewhat similar, but in the growth marketing world and the sense that um, I think you spent so many years just learning a particular craft or skill set. And it starts with that just inherent curiosity and then wanting to be, um, I don't know if it's like the best, but you feel like you have to, you have to know all aspects of it for you to continue to, you know, do well at your job. Right. And so you go down this rabbit hole, of just learning every facet of a particular craft or particular skill set, And then after a certain amount of time, people are asking you for advice and it comes maybe pretty naturally because you're just regurgitating mm -hmm. information that you, you know, soaked up like a sponge. Right. Um, yeah. It's, I, I really like the word that you used a few minutes ago. You used the word curious. And, and so often people use the word passion. Mm. And it's not, I'm not saying you don't need to have passion. Passion is brilliant. Passion is infectious. But I much prefer when we're talking about, you know, the work that we do. And, and particularly, I think when we're, we're acting in that influencer um, kind of role model, for, for younger people coming into our, our market, I think it's really important to to use the correct terminology that is far more helpful. And I think the word curious is really helpful uh, because curious to me is 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 a word that is it continues forever. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it. You know it's yeah. like you know, passion can fizzle out, can't it? Yeah, I get you know, it. it Whereas curiosity, it's just like, it's ever long. And I think it's more realistic. And I, I'd say to my, you know, I've got three kids, um, they're older kids. Uh, one of my one of my kids, he's he's just graduated, you know, and I'm, I'm talking to him about doing interviews and things like that, not not in cyber, um, but, but out, outside of it. And I'm saying curiosity, you know, curiosity, that's the most important thing. People will talk to you about passion. Nearly everyone will talk to you about passion and say, you've got to have passion but i really think it's it's curiosity curiosity i feel is more consistent yeah right? it's, it's and more sustainable. Have, yeah more sustainable yeah very interesting um very cool I, i'm glad that we kind of got through this this personal side of things and just how you kind of gotten into your position i think a lot of it resonates with a lot of people um especially kind of like as as i've interviewed a lot of different types of leaders from various you know fields of expertise like yeah. there's always these certain commonalities the things that we're talking about that that curiosity you know the consistency the uh the leveling up without necessarily knowing that you're leveling up and then being able to kind of graduate into this place of being an expert being a leader what and what does it actually mean and how how do you become personally like uh accepting of that as part of your journey right and i think that's always an interesting story to hear because everybody's path to it is a little bit different but the different experiences of those stages are somewhat similar yeah i think i think it all comes down to where you see yourself how you yeah. see yourself what's your standard where, where do you want to go how far do you want to go how brave yeah. are you you know because it requires so much courage to you know to to be visible to be visible to to speak um to ask questions all of those things and and to get things wrong and and to be judged and even when you are in that it's harsh and it's negative it's just like pick yourself up <laughs> try again do better yeah. or like change the company or start your own company um yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the funny part of that is like, I feel that anybody that's at your level or higher is usually, they're never the ones that judge, right? Because they're all there. They've all been, they've all taken the courage to put themselves out there to a certain degree. Well, I don't know. I, th I think I'm not so sure I agree with you on that one. <laughs> sometimes they can feel intimidated by you. And mm. um, sometimes they can be fearful of you. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I've, I've had that and I've seen that. So I don't, you have some fantastic leaders who will like throw down the ladder and like, yeah. come on, you know, come up here and then like go higher than me. You know, that's, that's wonderful. That That's definitely the type of leader I am. It's like when I'm mentoring folk, it's, it's very much a case of like, wow, now you are just flying. And now I kind of look up to you. <laughs> it's like throw down the ladder, help me, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but, but not, but that, that I think requires, um, um, not confidence, but it, it requires core strength. Mm. And, and what I see, I, yeah, I see leaders who can be quite insecure mm, and quite vulnerable. Good. Yeah. And so don't, and because, mm. because they are, they don't do that. And sometimes it can come down to culture. If they haven't been taught how to do that, then they don't kind of like pay that forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I want to kind of, I definitely want to go into your area of expertise now yeah. um, and, and just speak to, you know, even at a high level, but like, you know, you being in cyber for the past couple of decades and as somebody specifically that, you know, can maybe speak to this in a, maybe like a more layman terms to a general wider audience. Yeah. What is, what is, let's start with like, what is cybersecurity to you and, and what does that look like? how do you typically explain it and then what are some of those and we can speak more so to the to the recent uh, recent past but what has been some of the things that you've noticed um that's starting to be highlighted as like priorities or seeing like shifts in the landscape or the market that has becoming or, or, or starting to yeah. rise up as becoming the priorities today yeah loads of questions there i think you know cyber security is really about doing business as securely as you can Mm -hmm. And it's about it's about um, it's about bouncing back when when you when you're compromised, you know, when you're when you undergo a data breach, or or you know, uh, you, you you've undergone yeah a data breach. That's to me what it is. It's we talk a lot about cyber resilience, and that's it, it's not a case of if an attack is going to happen. Or really, when it's going to happen, it's when you discover it's been it, it's happened. So a lot of the companies out there are operating um, under the premise that they are okay. They've not been compromised. They've not been hacked. Um, information has not been stolen um, or modified, and and often it has. You know, so so that's why I say it's not necessarily a case of if or when. It's when you discover that you have. Mm. So, and, and really for me, it's very much about being prepared. You have to be prepared, no matter the size of your organization, whether you're a micro business or whether you're, a, you know, a huge giant, you've got to be prepared for, you know, for, for, for that eventuality, because it, it's, it's going to happen. You know, you've got cyber criminals targeting small businesses because they are ill-equipped. They don't know what to do. They don't. They haven't got a clue. They don't have the tools in place. They don't have the people in place. You've got cyber cyber criminals um, going after larger organisations because they um, the the return on their investment is is greater. So you've got a case of like volume, small companies, micro businesses, small to medium enterprises. Let's attack those on mass. We can make loads of money. Um, and then you've got a situation where you've got, okay, let's, let's be more targeted. Let's put more investment in, into this and let's go after bigger, you know, the, the, the bigger target to get a greater return. So that's, and that's just in terms of cyber criminals, you know, we've got other um, uh, threat actors out there, you know, who might not be wanting to just make money. They might want to be, um, getting an advantage it could be more on the cyber espionage side of things so they want to 
hack into your organization and and steal information so that they can get a head start on innovation or it could be a country that wants to um, target you and that can help them financially or it can help them in terms of innovation competitively um, and then you have activists who are out there so they want to disrupt and they want to get their ideology and agenda you know out to to the world so lots of different kind of scenarios there and the other one of course you've got you've got um well, i say of course but the other one you've got are um the accidental um, insiders so that they're employees who aren't meaning to make um to to cause an event they're not meaning to do something which is dangerous for your organization but invariably their behavior is so you you have got lots of different scenarios going on that can cause yeah. aggravation for you for your company both in terms of you know financially and also in terms of reputation and um and compliance you know regulation absolutely um yeah would love i mean would love to better understand what you know based on all those scenarios how has the landscape evolved in the past couple of years in terms of um, maybe, uh, I don't know what the right word is here, but like, uh, you know, I, I would say like, you know, with it, if we talk about time frame, right? Like internet itself is like very short lived, yeah. short life so, yeah. so far. And you talk about cybersecurity and how fast things are advancing around that it's catch it's it's at the same speed if not sometimes faster than what the public market is seeing right because you're you're this is this constant battle between two sides right um yeah. so i'm just curious yeah maybe it's we're, maybe the, the easiest way to describe it is like what has been some like the technological advancements in the security space that you started to see that's becoming more of a concern that didn't exist maybe like three four five years ago yeah it's a really good question i mean ai is AI is, you know, the the technology that everyone is talking about. So, yeah. generative AI um, and machine learning. So we're seeing more techno technological advancements. You know, with with the use of of, of those. Um, you know, we've seen that in the last couple of years, and we're seeing that um, you know well into the future, along with with quantum. I think. When I when I think about cyber cybersecurity and the advancements that that are being made, I I don't see them being made necessarily as fast as I do outside of cyber. I think we're mm -hmm. actually far more reactive. I think we're far more reactive than proactive, and I don't see huge innovative steps being made. I think if if there are innovative steps, it's leveraging off innovation that's going on in tech, like say Gen AI. So we have a situation where we've got hackers, our cyber cyber attackers, threat actors out there who are using Gen AI to come and you know cause cause havoc for organizations to get the upper hand to steal data, to do well financially, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have, you know, our organizations, our, our cybersecurity consultancies and um, tech firms who are using Gen AI and machine learning in order to enhance their products. And, and they may have been using um, in machine learning, for example, for quite a few years beforehand, yeah. but because it's quite fashionable now and everyone's jumping on the bandwagon, they're making more of a bigger thing of, of, about it. So I that's that's my view of how I, I, I see the market kind of, Evolve, evolving more yeah. in a proactive manner than necessarily groundbreaking um, discoveries. Yeah. I'm curious as to how threat actors are leveraging generative AI. Um, I think I've heard of like a few use cases where, you know, they, they were able to mimic certain leaders within the organization and then gain access to certain things. But um yeah, I'm curious as to like what are maybe yeah. some the different the different use cases that you started to see pop up because it is so new and it's so ever changing. Like, there's probably like an infinite amount of ways that they can leverage it, but maybe there, there's some that you're starting to see like become real threats. I mean, 
in terms of attacks and, and things like that, we've got phishing attacks, which are high. We've got um, Beck attacks, you know, business email compromise attacks. And we've got like cloud, you know, in, insecurities. Th those are, I think, the main, still the main uh, forms, still the highest forms of um, attacks out there. But certainly when it comes to Gen, I, Gen AI, we're seeing um, those threat actors using it um, really well because they they can now in the in the past we had situations whereby you would get an email th through and it was quite clear that it was not um you know it it wasn't genuine you know it was it was a it was an attack and um, simply because of the the language that was used the spelling errors and you would be training your employees to look for things like that, to look for grammar errors, spelling mistakes, and, and, and so on. Whereas now with, with Gen AI, we don't have that. You know, the the language um, that is used is is clean, it's good, it's solid. The translation that is going on is easy. You know, all of that is is available. And I think probably that's that's one of the um the biggest differences I think that we have now is in terms of like the capability, the the scale, because we have those two things like coupled together, the translation ability and the uh, clean grammar, sentence formation and, and, and things like that. Um, and how you can instruct Gen AI to mimic um, certain users behavior if you're being, if you're being targeted like the CEO and if there's information on them um, out out um, in the wild, which there will be, um, then they're just becoming so much more realistic you know, from an email perspective. And then when you throw in things like deep fakes, you know, you've got, oh, my God, you know, that, that it's becoming so difficult to actually ascertain. Is, is this, you know, the, the real person? Is this Chris? You know, am I speaking to Chris because you look like Chris? You sound like Chris. How can I tell that it's it's not you? You know, so so we have those situations now, and the price of these technologies are they're coming down, and we've got more competition, so um, the availability of them is is increasing. So you've got that ease, and you've got that lower cost, which is perfect for more cyber criminals to kind of latch onto and exploit. Yeah, um, all, all great points. Um, as we're rounding up on time here, just one, one final question and um, maybe it's a little bit more personal. Where do, you, where do you find yourself to be most happy or finding the most enjoyment over the next few years? Um, you know, I know you mentioned that this, this recent uh, adoption to kind of go all in on the influencer side of things is still relatively new for you, but is that something you plan to lean into much more heavily in this space in the next few years? Yeah, absolutely. I would like to do that, but I've also got my eye on the future as well. So it's <laughs> nothing's going to nothing's going to remain static, and I'm very much um, I'm not a static sort of person. So I think for me, it's probably going to be creating events. You mm. know, that's something that I'm kind of like looking to do. And I'm I I've been toying with this actually for quite a few years and not done anything with that. And I keep being encouraged to do this. Um, so we'll see. At the moment, I'm I'm good with the the influencer aspect. I'm really enjoying writing and researching and speaking, um, and kind of using my perspective to help the market to see things in a different light and to advance and help you know companies and and, and brands and governments sometimes to to do better with with the work that they're doing. But I think you know on the horizon it could well be, you know, uh, and some events that I'll, I'll do. I, I, in my head, I've got this particular type of event that I want to do and we'll see if that happens. I've been really cagey about it, but it could, it could be events. That would, could be fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to, I'm happy to share offline kind of, we, we started to do these uh, founder round tables across the country um, in 12 cities. Uh, we just started this year, but we, we ended up getting sponsorship from, JP Morgan and um and a law firm called Candell Gates, which is Bill Gates' dad. Uh oh, wow. and uh yeah, and we've we're 
we've done like eight cities so far. We're going to be in Raleigh, North Carolina and Washington, D.C. in September. But it started off as just this. It was, I'll tell you this, this story, but it started off as a combination of a breakup and not wanting to be in Los Angeles. And so I wanted to get out of L.A. And so I was like, let's just do this. And we in a combination of that and being double booked for an event that we did for L.A. and SF Tech Week. And so we had to come up with a different format. And so we came up with an entirely different format, tested it in the LA Tech Week, and it blew up. We had like 300 people show up. And uh, and so it was just taking a, a format that we saw on a on an ad hoc basis, turn into something that was that we saw there was a valid appetite for, yeah. and then just taking the format across the country and started just doing it for, um, yeah, just like these one-offs, did like four cities um, in 2023. And then it was all of a sudden like, hey, we should take this and see if we can get sponsors for it. And yeah, then did this year that way. Yeah, it's it so did like, you charge? Like did you charge the leaders to attend? We did not. No, um, but it's doing you know, it for free. Yeah, doing it for free right now. But like, it could become a monetization thing yeah. for sure. It was. I think we had to look at it as stages, right? So the first one was like proving there's an appetite in the market for yeah. it. Once we proved that there was an appetite, then it was like, okay, can we just do this at cost and not even like pay anything yeah. out of pocket for it? And yeah. then some sponsors to help us cover the networking part of it, the, you know, all, the the space, all that kind of stuff, and then getting the the hosts in or the guests in. The next version of it though would be creating into a business model where we charge more for spon like additional sponsorships, selling the different tiers of those. Um, you know, selling the the seats uh, as part of the panel, those kind of things. Yeah. But now we kind of have the playbook of it all figured out. Is it? Yeah, it's really good. I mean, it's it's that investment, isn't it? It's that okay. Well, let's try this. Let's see. Um, let's take the hit, and we'll we'll carry this. You know, for a period of time, and um, and then and then let's see if we can actually get sponsorship. And and I think also what's interesting with with things like that is is how it works commercially with the sponsors yeah it, you know if they come in they want to do their pitch or is it just a case of like sponsored by you know because what what i found with with some of the leader groups the leaders don't want the leaders want what you're offering but they don't want to be sold to or yeah. some don't want things sold to but you know it's it's hard i think either they have to pay if if they don't want to be pitched to by someone who's who's funding it yeah then they have to pay yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, again, I can share more about, but I think the, the, like, what what I found is like sponsors will pay money. They have budget for it. Like, if you talk about like a JP Morgan or like any of this, it doesn't even have to be them, but like even just like a few levels below that, people have budgets to pay for sponsorship for events. It's a lot easier to get those dollars than it is, I think, from like getting it from the the leaders that you want to bring in. Um, I think that if you can, you know, if you can bring in the leaders, uh, without even having to pay them, right? Yeah. And and get get the sponsors there, then you can charge people to come in to listen to those leaders also, and they're the ones that could be pitched to from the sponsors, and then you can create mini like a mini conference essentially. I've seen a few um, a few like organizations and like communities that have done it pretty well. Pavilion is one for the sales community, sales and marketing community, but they create like mini mini kind of like summits that are very yeah. well curated. It's like a few hundred people in attendance. Um, there's programming involved, but they focus on that niche of sales and marketing. And they've done a really great job of creating that. Um, so I'm thinking you're probably imagining something similar to that, but it's, mm -hmm. it's again, it's an investment in terms of like, cause you're trying to build up a movement or like, a, you know, a community, right? So it's like, yeah. it, there is, I think there's a certain level of patience of thinking about how to do that in stages to kind of get you to that place, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I built, I built a movement before and following, following my book, the insecurity um, book, but it was very much, you know, it's very, it's very different, you know, and it was very much like, I would say then, especially with hindsight, more of a passion project. And, and what I found, you know, certainly for, for that topic, um, even though like people were like, yeah, we're in the movement, like we're coming, we believe in you, we believe in this, you know, the mission and all of that. When it came to putting money into it, it's yeah. like oh. <laughs> that's where that's where I think again, like you have to 
I like now if we've done we've done 12 cities, we know the average attendance rate, we know how to get that attendance up. And yeah. those eyeballs, like now I can go back to some of the existing sponsors and be like, we're gonna charge you three X that and they're they'll be comfortable with it because yeah. they've now seen, you know, that and also I'm I'm confident in the fact that we know how to fill those rooms on a consistent basis. Yes. And I think that's just that's just the like I don't know if there's an easy way around that versus like forcing yourself to have to fill a room and knowing what the yeah I know now like for example like attrition will be 30 percent of registrations right so it's like yeah. if you want to fill a hundred person venue you need at least 150 to 180 to register right and yeah. those are things I wouldn't have known before and um yeah, yeah. And, and yeah anyways that's really that's really good so how many people go to your kind of like round tables how many do you get in <laughs> Yeah, it depends on the venue size, but they range anywhere from 50 to 300. So, um, yeah, so it just depends on the venue. But um, the like the larger cities that we've done, like the SFs, the LA, the New York stuff, like those are going to be 100 plus. Um, and then the smaller cities are going to be more intimate around 50 to 75. It's kind of how it works. Yeah. Wow, that's really good. Round tables. I was imagining like round tables. So you actually have round tables in those venues. And then yeah, so... Yeah. And so the, the, the format of it actually wasn't, is stolen from the Hollywood reporter does these round tables for actors and directors um, around Oscar time. And they just sit there and they talk about, you know, what their journey was like uh, to, as an actor or as a director or around a specific project. And they did just very much like ad hoc speaking very naturally and organically. And I thought it was like, you know, the founder journey, entrepreneurial journey is very similar to the artist journey. It's just maybe yeah. not like spoken about in that way. Uh, yeah. But the risks that you're taking and the real life implications of those risks are very similar, right? Like, you yeah. know, it's, it's not uncommon for founders to stay in a house with like 10 other people in the very beginning yeah. or, you know, like having to not pay themselves for a certain amount of time. Like, and some of this like feels very absurd, but like it is very commonplace. It's just not as much talked about it as, as it is. I think from like a creative perspective, you kind of accept like, these are the hardships if I'm going to take this risk on being like somebody creative, but yeah. it's very much the same way. So we've shared a lot of those stories and those have become like, I think um, why we've gotten to like a good, good draw is just because it's very humanizing and it makes it so that it's very approachable from other founders that are in that room or want to be entrepreneurs, want to be founders to understand like, this is what it, those, this is what those stories are. This is what it actually takes. And we have a good like mix of, diversity of like early stage founders that are like you know just raise their seed round to like some we've had like a mix of up to like publicly traded companies and um you know ceos that have like listed on nasdaq and like what i found interesting i think what the audience typically finds interesting is like the size and scale of the problems that you're solving for obviously have larger impact the larger the business but the emotional and psychological toll is always the same it's like, it doesn't matter if you're solving it for a thousand person company or you're solving it for yeah. a one person company. The, the feeling of you going through it is still the yeah. same and, and from day one, but yeah. um, the implications are just different. Yeah, so, so anyway, true. It's, so it's true. such an that interesting thing. Really, that sounds really good. So what do they get out of it? Is it just like, because it sounds very much community-based. It's just like, right. and the natural extension would be, okay, well, Community. Yeah, so the, the founders get out of it is, is basically visibility and content. So they get in front of, you know, an audience um, uh, yeah. that actually might make sense for them as, as, as customers or, or what have you. But more importantly, they get the content. So we record all of those pieces mm -hmm. and we we yeah. we cut it up so that um, not only do they get the long form, but they get all the short form clips of them speaking right in this way. And that's become very valuable for them. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. That sounds really yeah, good. Anyways, like, yeah, I can share more if you have curiosity, but yeah. let me know as you progress and I'm happy to share any yeah. Thank uh, you. just learnings that I've that I've kind of figured out along the way. But yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for that. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Uh on that note, I know we went way over, but thank you so much for taking the time today and just sharing your journey and also just your area of expertise. And again, if there's any way I can be of help to pay it back to you, let me know too. Thank you so much, Chris. Really appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>